Next, from Springfield, we talk to State Comptroller Leslie Munger and get her thoughts on how she views the role of the Comptroller, the reforms she would like to implement, the need for the state to update its severely outdated computer systems, and whether she believes the state should merge the Office of Comptroller and State Treasurer. This runs about 25 minutes. Comptroller Leslie Munger, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. Happy to be here. As I think anyone who watches uh, Illinois politics realizes, you were appointed to fulfill the uh, term of Judy Barjapinka uh, after her unexpected uh, death, uh, just after she was reelected to the post. And so a lot of people really don't necessarily know a whole lot about you since you didn't run for the office. So just so let's let's start there. Who, who is if someone says who is Leslie Munger? What do you say? I'm a lifelong Illinoisan, uh, born and raised in Joliet. Uh, went to school here in Illinois, University of Illinois, grad, proud Illini. I uh, went to Northwestern to get my uh, master's in business, at the Kellogg School of Management. Worked in Illinois, uh, worked at uh, McKinsey and Company, uh, Procter and Gamble, actually that was in Ohio, briefly, and uh, back to Illinois where I uh, worked at Helene Curtis. I am a businesswoman. I have 25 years of private sector business experience. I've led brands that most people have probably used in their own homes, Suave Shampoo, Finesse Conditioner, Degree Any Perspirant. I eventually was responsible for the $800 million U.S. hair care business at Helene Curtis. Uh, when I stopped working to raise uh, my children, uh, I probably should maybe back up and say I'm a wife. I'm married to John, my husband, for 20, almost 27 years. And we have two sons, Tom and Andy. Uh, Tom is 24, living in Texas right now. He's a U of I engineer. Our son Andy is about to graduate from U of I in accounting and finance in May. Uh, but when I stopped working to stay home and raise our kids, I became a volunteer in our community. And it, any busy person knows that you have a little time on your hands. Somebody will say, well, will you help with this? And, oh, yeah, I could, I could help with that. And then someone will say, well, would you get involved and in, in be on this? Oh, sure, I could help with that. And, and pretty soon before I knew it, I was involved in everything in my community. And uh, one of the things that I'm most uh, proud of my, my um, uh, volunteerism with is a group called the Riverside Foundation. It's a home for developmentally disabled adults in Lincolnshire. I've been an active volunteer with the Women's Board for 15 years. I've sat on the Board of Directors for the Foundation. Uh, it was actually there I saw firsthand how difficult it is when the state can't pay its bills. And uh, we, we on Riverside Board were taking out loans because the state was a year behind and a million dollars in arrears paying us at the time. And it was one of the things I noticed what a difference the comptroller can make because when Judy was elected comptroller and started prioritizing payments for not-for-profits, it was there that I saw, wow, you know, th there's, this is how someone can make a difference in the state. That was really my first personal connection with the comptroller's office. So, um, so I'm a businesswoman, I'm a volunteer in my community, I'm a wife, I'm a mother. Um, I love my state, my family is here, except for my son who's in Texas now. And we're hoping we'll get him back to Illinois. Uh, so you're, you obviously, that, those years in business, I think you had actually worked, uh, what was it, Helene Curtis with Ron Gidwitz? Yes. As we were saying, you were mentioning the, the shampoo products and yes. all? Yes. Uh, how does that business background mesh with, uh, with government? Now, obviously, you're just fairly new to government. And, and also, how is the culture different, would you say, uh, as far as how you operate in the business realm and you operate in the government realm? Well, it's interesting. The, the business realm, I think the state could use a little bit more of the business, at least, uh, focus from the standpoint of looking to do things more efficiently, more affordably. Uh, looking to improve, uh, in, in the case of brands, improve what you deliver to your consumers. In the case of government, improve services. So better services at the same cost or same services at a lower cost would be things that a business approach would bring to, to state government. Um, the culture, I think the most surprising thing to me as, a, as someone who's worked in business and also in a volunteer situation, you get a good idea, you get a group of people together, you say, let's get this done. You find out who you need to, to buy in. You all agree, you go do it. And so what I've learned in my very short time here in, in state government is you get a good idea, you talk to people, they say that's a great idea. Now first, you gotta get some legislation passed through the legislature, that'll take a few months. <laughs> and uh, we hope we can get it out of committee and then you have to figure out how it's gonna get funded and then hopefully in X amount of very long time, 
uh, you will be able to get going on it. So the timeline to get something done in government <laughs> is just so tremendously different than anything you would ever see in business. So. You find yourself chewing on pencils <laughs> of frustration. Uh, I just keep talking to a lot of people, honestly. I, I have been out, I have a few things that I'd like to get done in my time here as Comptroller, and I have been out talking to a lot of people just saying, this is why this is right to do, and try to build a lot of uh, enthusiasm about it, and also to answer questions on the front end of, of some of these things, because I think the more people understand you know, what I'm trying to accomplish here and why it's, it's a good thing for the state, um, I, I think more people will be able to say, oh, that makes a lot of sense, and, and we'll get it moving more quickly. What are you trying to, some, what are some of those good ideas, what are some things you're trying to accomplish? Well, let me just back up a minute and say, so when I look at what we need to do in our government, bringing my business perspective to bear here, I thought um, I'd like to see us look for things that we can do to make our government more transparent uh, so that we can follow the money, because if you can follow the money, you can change how, and you know where you're spending it, you can change how you're spending it. Uh, you probably know that we are very, very badly in debt in our state of, as of this morning. We have $8 billion in what we call a bill backlog. Um, that's the nice term for we spent $8 billion more than we can pay for right now. And so we have all these bills sitting, we have them in the comptroller's office or sitting in the agencies waiting to come in, but basically it's we've overspent our state credit card by $8 billion. We have to find ways to be more efficient and we have to find ways to make our government more affordable so we can pay these bills. And let me just go back to the point that I made earlier that it, it we are crowding out our ability to pay for critical services. People who need, who depend on state government, uh, like people at Riverside Foundation, who I uh, worked with, you know, these are people that we cannot fund anymore or have difficulty paying on time. We get phone calls in our office constantly from agencies and not-for-profits who we are behind paying them and, and they're hand-to-mouth for payments. So that's what, one of the reasons why it's important to get our state budget under control. So. So transparency uh, for where we spend our money, I think, is one of the most important things we can do. Second, looking for structural changes that we can do that will help our government operate less expensively, more efficiently going forward every single day. And third, looking for ways that we can just drive productiv productivity and efficiency through everything we do. Um, looking, I guess, for ways to spend each dollar more productively. So kind of three general buckets. So the the first thing I'd like to see us do is to implement a new statewide accounting system. If you've heard anything about what goes on, I want to underscore that because statewide accounting system, right? Is that what you said? Statewide accounting, or and they, they'll also use. You'll hear the term ERP, which is an enterprise re, enterprise resource planning tool. Um, companies use it. It would include payroll systems, financial systems, uh, eventually human resource management systems, etc. For the Comptroller's Office, my main concern is the payroll and the um, financial management systems. The systems that we currently have in our state are 30 plus years old. I think I heard our payroll People are system shocked to hear 35. that. I tell people they have 30 year old computers they're operating the state on. Yeah. And I say, you know, if you were talking to a group of people and said, raise your hand if you have a computer you're using that's over 10 years old, probably no one would raise their hand. And yet the state is doing billions of dollars with 30-year-old computers. Uh, one of the department heads a few years ago testified before the House that they can't find people to even write the code anymore because the system is so old. That's the big problem. So it's all written in COBOL. And um, I only know a little bit about COBOL because when I was in grad school back in the early 80s, that was what we had to do our computer programs on. When you say the word COBOL, people go, oh my gosh, COBOL. I did that back in the 70s. I did that back in the 80s. No one knows how to program that now. So these people who are doing the work and fixing our system and updating it are on the verge of retirement. You know, when they retire, there will be no one who can fix these systems anymore. So, you know, so it's there, really becoming critical. There is a practical, exactly, a critical need to just have, be able to maintain our ability to, to get paychecks out and to do, to roll financials to get a new system in place. Um, I think you've probably heard the state has over 800 different accounts. Uh, I, I couldn't believe that when I first heard it. Most states have somewhere 60 or less. So, and part of the problem is you start looking through the accounts, it's really hard to know where all that money is because there are so many different accounts you have to look through. So I ask the question, how come we can't have sub-accounts? Well, again, it's, it's 
because the system we have is so old. Believe it or not, we cannot have sub-accounts. In, in my own bank account, I have sub-accounts, <laughs> but we can't do it in the state. So it's, it's difficult to roll up the numbers and see here's a total that we're spending in this kind of category of expenses because those accounts are individually non-linked accounts. Are you, are you bringing people in, computer experts, whether from company A or I don't want to mention brands, or to say, take a look at what we have, give us a proposal on what it would take to upgrade? Yeah, so in the past year before I even was on board here, there was a request for a proposal done by the state uh, requesting information for both a, a package software, a software system and for companies to implement it. Those RFPs have been awarded. Uh, there are companies and, and programs that have been decided, waiting in the wings. What we need to do is get a contract signed and move ahead with it. Before we can do that, we have to figure out how to fund it. Before we can fund it, we have to get it through the legislature and, and help them understand it's important to do that. But if we are able to get that going, uh, it will help us, A, consolidate the funds that we have, B, help us, um, it will really reduce our cost because right now, all the different agencies, everyone who reports into the state financials is on a different accounting system. All of those systems are old. All of those require money and a lot of time and effort. Do to they even talk them. to each other? No. No, they do I mean, how do you therefore take it from agency X and bring in those numbers and merge them? So it all comes in individually. Some of the information comes in on paper. It has to be rekeyed. Um, some of the information is not compliant. They call it gap compliant with, with current accounting standards. Some of it is done on a cash basis, not accrual basis, which would be the um, accounting standard these days. All of that has to be adjusted. Uh, you can imagine that it's, it's ripe for errors uh, in all the transmission that has to, and translation that has to occur. It takes us almost nine months, eight and a half months, to get our financial report out after the end of the fiscal year, which one, it's really beyond and By the time usable. you get it out, it's no longer, it's, a, it was a snapshot in actionable. history. It's not actionable, right, it's not actionable. So all these reasons I think, you know, it'll be transparent. It will actually, most importantly, when we think about the cost of implementing something like this, will really help us reduce the ongoing cost of government, the efficiencies that it will bring, the, the, it will get the cost of maintaining all these separate systems out. Um, there's just a lot, of, it will help us be more efficient and more effective with how we use our financial data. And so I think it's probably the best thing I can do as comptroller. There, there are estimates, hundreds of millions of dollars it will save our state once we can get this implemented. So, um, I, you so know, I mean, it, I've often, I mean, this is an issue I was aware of uh, from having done previous interviews. And you wonder, I think the state, sometimes the state people don't want to spend money to upgrade because they think it'll look bad that they're spending money on themselves. And yet, would it not be true that even if we spent $200 million to upgrade the computer systems, you would get a payback on that in probably a relatively short amount of time? Depending on what the savings estimates are, there's one saving estimate that is huge, which I, I don't want to mention because I haven't verified it yet, but it came from one of the consulting companies that was helping us on the front end of this. Uh, the payback is anywhere from uh, three months to eight months. My so Lord. I mean, it's under a year. It is really there's so you no make over 100 percent a year uh, return Once on investment. Once it's fully up and running. So there is a roll-up period. It would probably take three to five years to get it fully implemented because we don't want to go out and just put it out there. You want to take it in small chunks and test it and make sure it's working before you roll it out further right. and before you bring on uh, you know other pieces of the system. But it would be something just like cloud-based. You know, you can update it. Um, just like your Windows automatically updates, or if you're on um, Microsoft or, or a Windows based or a Mac based system, you get all those automatic updates. Our systems do not automatically update. So n we would get to a point where we would not have an obsolete system constantly. Let's talk a little bit. You talk about, I think you said something like, what was it, 800 different accounts or how many? Eight to 900. Eight 800 to 900, to 900 yes. Uh, a lot of people are confused and understandably so when we talk about what the budget is for the state because we often refer to just the general, mm -hmm. uh, the GRF, the general revenue funds, which is kind of the general operating part of the budget. But that's only about something like 55% of the budget. Then we have all these accounts that are designated accounts, whether it's the road fund or the this fund or the right. that fund, and money goes into there. One of the proposed, one thing that's been done for years is these account sweeps where they say, well, you're not using the money in those yes. accounts. We're going to take it out. We're either going to take it out and repay it in time. I think now the proposal is that we're going to take it out and not repay it. We're just going to say you're not using it. 
Under that proposal, I've talked recently to a number of different people, some nonprofits like the LIHE program, some who are the people that dig up leaky uh, gas tanks at gas stations and say, you know, we need that money sitting there so that when we have a leaky gas tank, we, we can dig that up. So they say that is a false uh, figure to look at that money sitting there and say it's not being utilized so we can take it. But what are your thoughts in general on this, the, the policy of fund sweeps and relative to the concerns as voiced by some of these others? Um, I think that we have used fund sweeps in the past uh, in our government and honestly it's gotten us into some trouble doing that because we eventually owe that money back and so what it, the, the net effect has been to raise our spending in our state and put us more in debt and that's actually between borrowing money and sweeping money from funds that we have to repay is part of the reason why we have an eight billion dollar debt right now that we need to pay. Um, I say that with the full understanding that we have some critical needs to pay for now in this current year budget because the budget that was passed by the legislature was not balanced when it, it had more spending in it than it had funding for it. And so now we're in this urgent need to address the issues for things like child care as an example uh, where the funds have run out. Um, I think what, whatever we do with sweeping of funds and I know the governors and the legislator, it, legislature is looking for ways to use some of that money. Uh, we have to do it with a good uh, we have to we have to address the urgent needs of our state, but we have to do it in a way that we maintain the long term the understanding of the long term consequences of doing that so that we do not add to our deficit. Uh, I think that some of the funds that if we can we have to look at them individually on a case by case basis. I think that some of those funds possibly by the time we would need to use them that money could go back in. There are certain things like um, that, that are self funding because of taxes on um, various services. Well, the more. gas tank, uh, gas as I mentioned, uh, about 1.1 cent of every gallon that's pumped into a car would go towards the right. fund for replacing those gas tanks underground storage. Right. So I think we have to look at everything. I think borrowing with the intent to repay is will be difficult because we can't repay. We can't even pay the bills that we have now. And we need to get to a point where we're not borrowing money that we have to repay anymore. We're living within our means and, and, and working down our debt. If there are funds out there case by case, where by the time we think we're going to need those funds, there will be enough additional funds put in there through the normal course of the taxes or whatever, the way the, way the money flows into those, uh, those funds, then I think you know, it's up to the governor and the legislature to work through which, what amount of money they can take from those, still maintaining our ability to deliver the services that those were set up to serve, um, to provide, but to, to help offset some of these budget issues this year. Uh, I want to run, before we run out of time, just to touch on a couple of those issues. Uh, to, the, to what extent, just in the way you view your, your job, and again, mm -hmm. I, understandably, you're just kind of getting your feet on the ground and getting into it, but do you see yourself from what we've talked about as someone who's going to come in and say, look, I have management experience. Mm -hmm. This is just crazy the way this is, as we've already talked about, like the computer systems. And to what extent do you have to evolve into a political person to some extent and I say to some extent because it seems like so much of the comptroller's job is almost more of a mechanical job. I mean, you, you collect, the, get the revenues into the accounts, you disperse them, you want to have good records. It, it's not so much, it doesn't seem to me, be, being a political position as much as one of a, a good manager. Is that, I, I'm wondering how you see that. I, I agree with you on that. It is very much of a, I think, a nonpartisan role in many respects. I mean, I, I come to this job trying to really bring uh, good fiscal responsibility into this position. And my staff, you, know, you mentioned being a manager, my staff will, will uh, say I'm, I'm a roll up the sleeves, dig in, understand the problem, and try and make a difference person, which is actually why I'm really um, thrilled, honored, and so uh, feel so lucky that I landed in this position. I am, like, I'm a problem solver, that's what I did in my career. We have problems that have to be solved in our state that are financial problems that I think my experience uh, can be of help in, and, and um, not just in um, not just in looking at financials, but looking at things like this new statewide accounting system, and trying to be a, a, an idea leader um, to bring things like that forward. Another thing that people have talked a lot about is the consolidation of the fiscal offices in the state. Companies have one CFO. A lot of states have a CFO. We have two uh, separate fiscal offices. There's some savings as a result of combining that. Um, it's been out there for a long time, 
it would be a nice structural change to our government to just reduce another layer in, in cost. And that was going to be a question. So you're in favor of merger of the two I offices. I am in favor of merger. Which office, office would go away? I think what you do is you would merge the functions into probably a new office and uh, just for the lack of a better term, you know, a chief financial officer office. Um, just like you would have in a company under which there would be treasury function and a controller function just like companies have. But you would reduce it to one constitutional officer. You would combine and be able to share resources and systems and, there, and, and reduce the number of extraneous offices. Um, so I, I think it's an efficiency. Uh, it's an efficiency move, and it's something that businesses in other states have done. So, you know, I, I know why we originally split it, or what the state split it into two, with, with controls and a lot of things that are available today that weren't available back in 1970. You know, I, I believe that we could do it efficiently. It saves... And part of perhaps upgrading your computer system might exactly. even be more of a yes. place to have uh, cost containment and, and yes. Then you have checks. revenues coming in, you know, it's all, it's all coming into the same area, you know, a financial office. So I'd like to see us do that. Uh, that's something else I'm, I'm working on. That idea's been out there a long time um, as well. It's not as big of a savings as uh, getting a new accounting system would be. So that really the accounting system has been my first my first and my first focus, but um, it saves. I think the estimates are something like twelve million dollars. Twelve million dollars is a lot of money to me, and I, I think if we can save twelve million here and we can save a million there and five hundred thousand there, you know, those are the kind of savings we have to start nipping and, and grabbing so that we can get out of the eight billion dollar debt that we have. You know, one of the uh, few areas where there is a I don't know controversial, interesting uh, in in your brief career thus far was this when Governor Rauner had the uh, executive order relative to union fees and then you said, no, I'm not going to hold those back. Can you walk us through that issue and to what extent were you consulted before he had that or not? And just bring us behind the scenes on how all this all came to pass. Um, so we were not consulted by the governor's office. Um, he put out the executive order and um, I felt first and foremost that I am put here to to support all the people in Illinois, most importantly, I have to follow the law. And uh, within the statute that of the responsibilities that I have as comptroller, um, I cannot, and actually I think this is a good thing, uh, I cannot go set up a separate account or move money from one account into another account without being directed to do so by the legislature or by a court. Um, there's no precedent for me to have done that anywhere in the comptroller's history. And as I think forward, I think it, the reason I said I think it's a good thing is because I don't think we want the comptroller's office to be able to say, I think I'd like to have a fund and move this money over here without it being somehow coordinated. It's a good check and balance that I cannot do that. So when the governor asked me to help um, execute through that executive order, it would have required me to set up a separate fund and to move those fair share dollars into a fund. And I could do neither uh, legally. So we. Um, we told the governor's office we can't do that, and um, they, I believe, have found a way to do that internally within their own set of agencies. Time's growing short, uh, but if the offices aren't merged, I don't know where we are there, would you run for the office uh, next time? Or do you have an intention to do that if, if, if that were still, the office was still existed as now? So I, I will be running for re-election in 2016. This should be a four-year appointment, but um, uh, the legislature and the governor passed a, a law saying I, this is going to be a special election. Um, with respect to the merging of offices, the first thing we have to do is actually get that on the ballot as a constitutional amendment to merge the offices. So if I'm successful in doing that, that would be an amendment in 2016 uh, to be merged in 2018. So that's four years down the road. I, I can't even think about that. I've got $8 billion of bills right now. I have to worry about figure, finding out a you way to You might have pay. second thoughts by that. But, <laughs> I, uh, right now, I have a lot on my plate, and I'm just going to focus on doing the best job I can do in my office by trying to lead common sense, fiscal reforms, fiscal responsibility, things that will help us be more efficient and more effective in running our state, and I'm going to let everything else sort itself out. And uh, I think if I do a good job, uh, hopefully the people of Illinois will, will know that and want to support me in 2016. All right. Well, Comptroller Leslie Munger, we appreciate you taking time to speak Thank with you. us. Thank you. Thanks good, very much for talking with me. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of Illinois state government 
and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois.